Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Jimmy McGregor. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve the condition of the road network in the Highlands and Islands. Minister Keith Brown. Uh, since 2007, the Scottish Government has spent in excess of £336 million to maintain and improve trunk roads in the Highlands and Islands. Uh, local roads, though, are a matter for local authorities. Uh, well, I thank the Minister for that reply, but does the Transport Minister share my constituents' concerns about the poor condition and potholed state of many local roads throughout the Highlands and Islands, which is damaging to cars is dangerous to motorcyclists and which can also leave a bad impression for tourists. What discussions have the Minister had with local authorities in my region on this subject recently and does he believe enough is being done to address concerns that have been highlighted repeatedly by Audit in Scotland? Keith Brown. I think the member is right to say that we can, of course, always do more. And that's true both in terms of the trunk road network. The Scottish Government controls around 6% of the roads in Scotland. The rest are controlled by uh, local authorities. And it's also true in relation to local roads as well. I would say for local authorities, they also have uh, substantial financial pressures as they look towards the road maintenance programmes. Uh, we have had around a 26% cut, for example, to the Scottish Government's capital budget. And, of course, there is pressure on public finances, which is bound to work through in relation to this. But the discussions that the member asked about uh, would include discussions that we've had, for example, with Argyll and Butte local authority, where we've agreed to trunk uh, the 83 road from Kenny Craig to Campbelltown. Uh, those discussions are ongoing and are going well, and we expect to have uh, a transfer of responsibility from that road, from the local authority, uh, to the uh, Scottish Government in July this year or thereabouts. But I would say, in relation to the resources which are at the root of all this, we have pressured public finances, and certainly it's not helped, of course, by voting for around £776 million to spend on trams in Edinburgh rather than the roadworks around the whole country. Question number two, Jimmy Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing has had with NHS boards regarding the operation of private finance initiative contracts. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government is committed to the non-profit distributing model as its preferred procurement option for revenue finance projects. Unlike under PFI, the level of private sector returns is capped under NPD. In addition, services provided as part of NPD contracts are limited to those that relate to the maintenance and fabric of the buildings. However, there remain 28 historical PFI agreements in NHS Scotland. The NHS in Scotland pays £215 million in unity charges under PFI, and of this, £86 million relates to service charges. An NHS Scotland group, including all boards with PFI contracts, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Futures Trust, has been working to improve contract management and deliver savings on these contracts. This work has already achieved £1.3 million worth of annual savings, which will save £20 million over the remaining life of the contracts. By the end of 2014-15, savings over the remaining life of the contracts will rise to £26 million. These savings will be reinvested in NHS services. Jim I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And, uh, can I ask him, is he aware that the PFI contract, notwithstanding uh, the savings that the government is uh, negotiating, um, the, the PFI contract for the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary stipulates that if the health board does not walk away after, after, after 25 years of the 30-year contract, it is bound to pay consort an annual management fee for the next 25-year period. Can he confirm the net value of the management fee which would apply in this circumstance? And does he agree with me that these golden handcuffs shackle the NHS to a land deal and a contract which is against the public interest? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I am aware that an ongoing payment made during the secondary payment are for facility services to be provided by the contractor rather than a management fee if the board does not walk away. The precise cost of these services cannot be precisely defined at this point but are determined by provisions within the contract that base this calculation on all expenditure on the facilities over the previous five-year period, which this, of course, was approved by the then Labour government at that time. Clearly, these ongoing obligations are not helpful, which is why contracts signed from around 2000 onwards either use leases which end with contract or more recently, including the NPD and hub projects, grant only licence to service provider and therefore do not face the same issues. Question number three, Adam Ingram. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made to resolve the environmental issues arising from the abandonment of open cast coal sites in East Ayrshire. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, officer, the Scottish Government consultation entitled Open Cast Coal Restoration Effective Regulation closed in February this year and subgroups on financial instruments and compliance monitoring will report back in due course. The restoration of sites is a long process, however active restoration is now underway on sites in Dumfries and Galloway, in Fife, in South Lanarkshire and in East Ayrshire. My officials and the Scottish Mines Restorations Trust continue to work closely with relevant local authorities to assist them in their restoration planning. Adam Ingram. I thank the Minister for, for that answer. Can he also provide an update on discussions with the UK Government about returning Scotland's share of the coal levy payments to assist with the restoration of open cast coal sites? Minister. Uh, yes, I can. I did write, presiding officer, to the UK Government on the 17th of September last year and the 20th November requesting that the royalties collected by the UK Coal Authority for coal produced in Scotland, amounting to over £15 million, be now made available to help fund the restoration of legacy open cast sites across Scotland. A holding response was received from Michael Fallon, the UK Energy Minister, on the 8th of January this year to say that this request is being actively pursued with the UK Treasury at this time. We have received no further written communication. I raise this matter again with DEC at the Cross-Party Scottish Coal Industry Task Force, which I chair on the 7th of April. And I also uh, spoke with Michael Fallon on this issue when we met in Houston, Texas last week. We continue to pursue this line of inquiry with the UK Government, and I recognise Adam Ingram's uh, continued campaigning efforts to ensure the return to Scotland of this money, which is much needed to deal with the urgent task of restoration. Question number four, Mark Griffin. To ask the Scottish Government how many local authorities have adapted the loop equipment that they provide to people with hearing loss since the introduction of digital televisions and radios? Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presenting officer, this information is not held centrally by the Scottish Government. It is a matter for individual local authorities to assess which hearing loop equipment they will provide to people with a hearing impairment. Matt Griffin. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Hard, hard of hearing people rely on that loop equipment to get any enjoyment for their TV or radio. Um, some local authorities haven't adapted that equipment since the switch over from analogue to digital. Um, is the Minister willing to write to lo local authorities to get an understanding of the situation nationally and issue um, guidance to local authorities um, to, to switch over to that modernised equipment as soon as possible? Cabinet Secretary. I have been encouraging local authorities to make the switch over, but I am more than happy to write again to them to encourage them to do so, because, as the member rightly says, it is of a huge material benefit to the recipients. Question 5, Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what guidance it provides to NHS boards on prescribing blood glucose test strips. Cabinet Secretary, Alex Neil. Presiding officer, we expect clinicians to refer to sign guideline 116 on the management of diabetes, which makes it clear who would benefit the most from self-monitoring of blood glucose. Roderick Campbell. Cabinet Secretary, for that answer. According to Diabetes UK, uh, many members of the public are concerned that the provision of test strips is patchy and inconsistent. Can the Cabinet Secretary assure me that the Scottish Government is taking steps to avoid that situation in Scotland and to ensure parity of access across all health boards? Minister. The presenting officer is for clinicians to determine the treatment regime that is best for each individual patient, taking into account the relevant local and national clinical guidelines which I referred to in my previous reply. National clinical guidelines are quite clear that people with diabetes who are treated with insulin should be provided with blood glucose test strips. Current guidance suggests that for people with diabetes who are not using insulin, self-monitoring of blood glucose may lack significant benefit with little or no effect on gly glycemic control and is unlikely to be clinically or indeed cost-effective in addition to usual care. Question 6, Tavis Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assistance is being provided to, to deliver ophthalmology services in Shetland. Cabinet Secretary Alex 
uh, presiding officer, it's a matter for NHS Shetland to utilise its funding in the most appropriate way to meet local health needs and priorities, including the provision of ophthalmology services. Uh, the payments made by NHS Shetland for general ophthalmic services for the years for which data is available has risen from £342,000 to £360,000 during 2012-13, and that's since 2008-09. I'm grateful to the Minister for that reply. Is he aware that the eye scans that many Shetland patients need are now available in a machine through an optician in Lerwick? Would he understand that that would save the NHS money because patients would then not have to travel to Aberdeen and Aberdeen Royal Infirmary? And would he undertake to cut through any NHS red tape that is currently stopping that process beginning in Shetland and therefore being available at much less convenience to, or much greater convenience rather, to patients and at a great saving to the NHS? Presiding officer, I absolutely would like to take up that suggestion and I will do everything I possibly can to facilitate that change. And if the member wants to write to me with more detail, I'll make sure we cover every possible angle in this because it's a common sense approach to dealing with this issue. Richard Simpson. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could update us on the uh, progress on the uh, provision of uh, IT links between optometrists and ophthalmic departments in Shetland and indeed in other parts of the country. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, we are making significant progress, but I will write in detail to the member to give him a detailed update. Question number seven, Mary Scanlon. To ask the Scottish Executive what progress has been made toward meeting accident and emergency waiting time targets. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, I think it's theme questions today for me. The Scottish Government is making good progress towards meeting accident and emergency waiting times targets since the launch of the £50 million three-year national unscheduled care programme in February last year. There has been a measured improvement in the overall four-hour performance target from 90.3% in December 2012, increasing to 93.5% in December 2013. There has also been a significant improvement in patients waiting over 12 hours. Uh, com compared to December 2012 against December 2013, there has been an 87% reduction in patients waiting over 12 hours, which is very welcome. Each health board has a local unscheduled care action plan which supports improvement in A&E waiting times. Additionally, boards are implementing lessons and best practice from across the country in order to bring about improved performance. The Scottish Government continues to work closely with the health boards to ensure that A&E performance reaches a sustained level of performance, not just the interim target of 95%, but continually striving towards the 98% standard. Mary Scanlon. Well, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that most extensive and thorough <laughs> response to my question. Um, the Audit Scotland report uh, from last week states that 19 out of 31 A&E departments receive no referrals for admission from GPs. And I just ask, is it the case that many patients are now bypassing their GP, putting additional pressure on A&E departments? And I just want to ask if any work is being done by the government to help understand this issue. Presiding officer, in many situations, actually, the GPs bypass the A&E procedure rather than the other way about. And therefore, these figures reflect that. But it's all part and parcel of trying to get the improvements uh, rolled out in A&E right across the country. Essentially, the key issue here is patient flow. And therefore, rather than uh, clog up A&E, uh, there are many health boards who have the arrangement whereby if the GP wishes to make an admission, they can do so directly into the ward rather than having the patient needing to go through the A&E department. Aileen McLeod. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Can uh, I ask the cabinet secretary what progress the current Scottish government has made in increasing the number of A&E consultants since taking office and what further progress is being made through the £50 million unscheduled care action plan? Cabinet secretary. A presenting officer, since taking office, we've increased the number of A&E consultants by 86.5 full-time equivalent from 75.8 to 162.3. That's an increase of 114% under this government. 
The unscheduled care action plan has supported recruitment of an additional 18 of these a &E consultants. In year two of the three-year action plan, we will maintain a focus on achieving the a &E target, as well as focusing on sustaining improvements and on whole system approaches, creating local community partnerships where hospitals and primary community care services are aligned and focused on patients getting seen by the right member of the multidisciplinary team at the right time. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns about a &E waiting times in NHS Ayrshire and Arran and targets that have not been met? A problem which is exacerbated, as he will know, by a lack of available beds. And what can the Scottish Government do to help resolve this problem? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, while Ayrshire and Arran have not met the 95 per cent target consistently, they are much better than what they used to be, and they are averaging just over 93 per cent. The issue is not actually lack of bed capacity in Ayrshire, it is the flow of patients. A uh, too low a percentage of the daily discharges are made in the morning or early afternoon, and that means that beds are not being freed up during the day in the wards to receive incoming patients from A&E and indeed from normal admissions. And it's that flow that is really at the core of many of these issues. And that's why we are rolling out, for example, we're doing many things, but we're rolling out the electronic whiteboard uh, across the country because that improves the management of beds and patients and staffing right through the hospital. Question number eight, John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many cataract operations the NHS performs each year. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the latest available information shows activity has risen from 31,892 in 2008 9 to a provisional figure of 36,340 cataract procedures being carried out in NHS Scotland during 2012 13, an increase of 13.9%. John Wilson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Could he outline to me what additional follow-up procedures are in place in terms of patient treatment plans after cataract operations which have led to complications, and how elderly patients can be reassured about the procedures, particularly when they may not have had a good experience the first time round, particularly if they're waiting on a second operation? Cabinet Secretary. I would say uh, to give a two-pronged re reply to that, uh, Presiding Officer. First of all, in terms of every patient who gets a cataract operation, there is a standard follow-up procedure uh, laid out in clinical guidelines and protocols, whereby the consultant and related services follow up with the patient to check progress and check, in particular, that the operation has been successful uh, and to deal with any side effects that may arise. But secondly, if a patient has had an unsatisfactory experience, then they should use the complaints procedure within that health board to register their complaint or concern and make sure that that is dealt with. Uh, one of the changes we are making across the National Health Service in Scotland is to use complaints not just for dealing with the specific complaints, but to use them to provide management intelligence on where things are not running as smoothly as they could and should. And indeed, in a number of health boards already, every complaint is actually treated as an adverse event. And again, that is why I would encourage every patient to use the complaints procedure. Question number nine, Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the payment of the state pension in an independent Scotland. A different Cabinet Secretary, John Swinney. Uh, Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government this week published updated research on the state pension and its impact in Scotland. It showed that men and women who have the same pension entitlement will get less in Scotland than the UK if we stay tied to the Westminster pension and welfare system. In terms of our assessment of the payment of the state pension in Scotland, we are well placed to afford a decent social security system with welfare, including pensions, being consistently more affordable in Scotland than in the United Kingdom. We are also well served in having much of the infrastructure in place to deliver a strong social security system. Annabelle Ewing. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. And given the less than inspiring comments we've had from Labour over the last couple of days, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it is an absolute disgrace that Labour Party politicians are more interested in towing the Tory line on the state pension age rather than standing up for their constituents? Yeah. Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, I think Annabel Ewing highlights an issue of fairness. Um, it cannot be fair 
that a 65-year-old can expect the lifetime value of their state pension to be about uh, £11,000 for women or £10,000 for men less in Scotland than in the UK as a whole, based on the same entitlement. It is worth remembering that previous UK governments do not have a strong record when it comes to protecting the state pension. They reduced the long-term value of the state pension when they abolished the link between the state pension and earnings, and that was not restored by the Labour government. Exactly. In an independent Scotland, we have already said that it is right and proper we look again at raising the state pension age. We will do what we always do, act in the best interests of the people of Scotland. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one.